Okay, so welcome to this second video in which we're discussing uh, mechanisms underlying motor, well, believed to underlie motor learning in the cerebellum, namely uh, long-term depression in cerebellar Purkinje cells. Right, okay, so so far we've discussed the sort of grandiose scheme here, which is that um, the, um, when um, these climbing fibres fire out, they will uh, stimulate long-term depression of any synaptic contact between a granule cell and the dendritic spine of a Purkinje cell that was active at the time that the climbing fiber fires, basically. And that's because the activation of the climbing fibers, it only happens when the calibration has gone wrong. And uh, this is going to weaken those uh, contacts that were involved in basically uh, incorrect calibration. Okay, so now what we want to have a look at is the more molecular details of this. So we're going to have a look firstly at the um, details of this synapse between granule cells and Purkinje cells. So this sort of classical synapse, i.e. between an axon terminal and the dendritic um, spine. Right, so let's draw a bigger picture of this, basically. So here is our dendritic spine here of our Purkinje cell, and it's going to be connected to an axon terminal of a granule cell. So here is our axon terminal of the granule cell. And basically what's going to happen is the axon terminal of this granule cell is going to release glutamate. So this is the granule cell here, granule cell, and um, here is the Purkinje cell. And as I say, the granule cell is going to release the neurotransmitter glutamate. Now, you might expect this Purkinje cell to then have um, to have ionotropic glutamate receptors, but it doesn't. It has met metabotropic glutamate receptors of the first type. So, right. So let's take a step back. Glutamate is released by the granule cell. So um, glutamate's going into this. Um, into the um, synaptic cleft here. So I'll draw glutamate as a little circle. Okay, so this is going to represent glutamate molecule. Um, I'll just label it up. So this is our glutamate here. And the granule cell has released glutamate. And now it's going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft and it's going to bind to these type 1 metabotropic glutamate receptors. Now let me just give you a reminder of what a type 1 metabotropic glutamate receptor is. So there are basically eight different types of metabotropic glutamate receptors. Eight different genes coding for metabotropic glutamate receptors. And basically, metabotropic glutamate receptors are uh, GPCRs, the G protein coupled receptors, rather than being uh, ligand gated ion channels. Uh, so, ionotropic glutamate receptors are ligand gated ion channels, and metabotropic glutamate receptors are uh, ones coupled to G protein mechanisms. Okay, now a type 1 metabotropic glutamate receptor, which is what this is, there are two of the eight genes. Uh, for metabotropic glutamate receptors, which are counted as type 1 uh, metabotropic glutamate receptors. Okay, and those two genes are the metabotropic glutamate receptor gene 1 and the metabotropic glutamate receptor uh, gene 5. So type 1 metabotropic glutamate receptors. Okay, so there are two genes that this that this um, specific metabotropic glutamate receptor could have been made from. And those two genes, as I say, are, let me just put them up here, it could have been made from the M-GLU, which stands for metabotropic glutamate receptor 1, or it could be a metabotropic glutamate receptor 5. So both of those are counted as type 1 metabotropic glutamate receptors. So this is just a type 1 metabotropic glutamate receptor. So it's one of these two. Right, and basically it is coupled to the GQ protein. So let's show this. So the GQ protein is a heterotrimeric G protein. So it consists of an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit. So here are the alpha subunit, the beta subunit, and the gamma subunit. And basically, if it's a GQ protein, it means that the alpha subunit is specifically alpha Q. 
We don't know what the beta subunit and we don't know what the gamma subunit are. So remember, the, there are five different options for what beta subunit you put there, and there are 12 different options for what gamma subunit you can use. So there are many different GQ proteins, but the important thing is that the alpha subunit is this specific alpha subunit, i.e. it's alpha Q. Right, so initially, when the G protein is inactive, the alpha Q subunit has GDP bound to it. So this is a GDP molecule here, bound to our alpha Q um, subunit. And when glutamate binds to this metabotropic glutamate receptor, it's going to become catalytically active. And basically, it's going to break off this bond uh, between the GDP and the alpha Q subunit and attach on GTP to that alpha Q subunit instead. So you get GTP, um, guanosine triphosphate, bound to our alpha Q subunit instead. So here's our alpha Q. Okay, and once uh, GTP has bound to alpha Q, it no longer wants to associate with the beta and the gamma subunit, so they go off. So here's our beta subunit, and here's our gamma subunit. So this is beta gamma subunit. So this breaks up into these two um, when this. Um, G protein coupled receptor, this type 1 metabotropic glutamate receptor, catalyzes this exchange of GDP for GTP on the alpha Q subunit. Now, alpha Q GTP goes off and activates an enzyme which is in the uh, cell membrane of this dendritic spine. So there's an enzyme in the cell membrane of the dendritic spine, and this enzyme is known as phospholipase C. And the specific type of phospholipase C that is activated by alpha Q GTP is phospholipase C beta. So this is phospholipase C beta, and this G alpha Q GTP is going to go and activate that phospholipase C beta. Okay, phospholipase C beta's activity is then as we've seen in detail in previous videos, is to break down a component of the membrane known as PIP2, and it breaks it down into diacylglyceride, so DAG, and IP3, basically. So here comes IP3. Okay, so, so far what we have done is we've created IP3. Now, IP3's activity is then to go to the endoplasmic reticulum. So where should I draw this? So we'll draw the endoplasmic reticulum down here because we're running out of space. So here's the endoplasmic reticulum the ER, and basically in the endoplasmic reticulum, we've seen now that you have these IP3 receptors. So let me draw an IP3 receptor here. So remember, IP3 receptors consist of these four subunits, uh, which I can't draw, well actually, let's, let's get another piece of, well, let's turn over and draw a bigger picture of this, because it's getting too cramped. Right, so, so far what we've got to is IP3 has gone up in, um, the um, cytoplasm of um, the dendritic spine. Now, let's say here we have our endoplasmic reticulum. So this represents our endoplasmic reticulum, which is an intracellular organelle which sequesters calcium. Endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and now what we have in this membrane is one of these IP3 receptors, which is a massive great receptor consisting of uh, four subunits. So here are the four different subunits here. And um, each one of those four subunits is a polypeptide in its own right. And there are three different genes coding for polypeptides that you can use in the building of this IP3 receptor. And um, these um, three different genes can either be combined to make homotetramers, where you use the same protein in all four sockets, basically, i.e. you use one gene to make all four proteins and combine them together to make an IP3 receptor, or uh, you can make heterotetramers, where you basically use different genes to make different proteins which you put in all four sockets. Right, so... What happens is that the IP3 molecule, when IP3 goes up in the cytoplasm, IP3 molecules are going to bind to this IP3 receptor. Now, each one of the four subunits that makes up the IP3 receptor has an IP3 binding site. So basically, if I denote IP3 just as a pink blob from now on, then what's going to happen is that an IP3 molecule is going to bind to that, um, that subunit of the IP3 receptor, another one is going to bind there, 
another one to this one, and another one to this one. So you overall get four IP3 molecules binding to the IP3 receptor, one to each of the four subunits, basically. Now, IP3, as we discussed in length in the previous video, does not cause this receptor to open. It does not. What it does is it makes available uh, a stimulatory calcium binding site. So when IP3 binds to uh, the subunits of this IP3 receptor, the conformation of those subunits changes so that um, uh, a new binding site becomes available, a new activatory uh, calcium binding site becomes available. So it changes conformation and it makes available a new binding site to which calcium can bind. And if calcium binds to that binding site now, that will cause this IP3 receptor to open. Right. Okay. So where do we get the calcium from then? Uh, well, basically this is where the mossy fi uh, the climbing fibers come in. So uh, we've seen, if I just turn over back a, for a moment, that if we want to produce long-term depression of this synaptic contact uh, between, um, well, the synaptic contact between the granule cell and the dendritic spine of the Purkinje cell, then we need to activate this climbing fiber at the same time that this synapse was activated, basically. Okay, and what we're going to see is that the way in which this is achieved is by the release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. So what causes long-term depression? It's basically the release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum, what it's hypothesized to be in a way, it's speculated to be. Um, so IP3 receptors effectively act as a coincidence detector. IP3 receptors are going to um, look and see whether um, this neuron uh, this synapse was active at the same time that the climbing fiber was active because if they're both active at the same time, the climbing fiber basically provides the calcium, the granule cell synapse provides the IP3, and together they will both open the IP3 receptor, and then that release of calcium basically is what's believed to underlie long-term depression. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.